Please join me in giving Dr. Karen Countryman Roseworm a warm Pachyderm Club welcome. Thank you. Welcome. It's so funny because we were the first ones here. I had my computer up. Others can even vouch for me that I had the slides up. They looked perfect. I'm an early bird because there are always problems. And sure enough, we got the projector five minutes before I was supposed to start, and then it doesn't work. Um, so I apologize that that happened. And um, we can plan ahead, but it's a good thing that you know your topic, right? at the end of the day. So I have to tell you, I really struggled um, when preparing for this presentation today because while I'm based here in Wichita, Kansas, and I have spent over 23 years working with this population in Wichita, Kansas, I rarely speak in Wichita, Kansas anymore. Uh, we work with survivors here, but I'm traveling all over the country, all over the world, working with our other agencies and other providers. And, and so when I speak here, I typically send just a staff and, um, from the Center for Combating Human Trafficking. And when I speak here in, in Wichita, Kansas, it is specifically so close to my heart because I know the, the struggles that we have in our home. As I prepared, I thought about all of the things going on in Kansas. How many of you have seen the news articles about Department of Children and Families? So we have kids who are missing, of course. We have a system that clearly, as a system, can't in of itself solve all of our problems with children, youth, and families, right? So we have kids missing. We have uh, kids being charged with trafficking. We have a lot of problems. And I was struggling with, how do I say something that actually makes a difference to this group, and specifically, to pachyderm, what does pachyderm mean? And what would I say that would matter to them? Does one of you know the pachyderm preamble? Could you say it? What's the pachyderm preamble? I had it on my slide, otherwise I'd tell you, so I'm looking to you all to know it. Can somebody stand up and say the pachyderm preamble? This is on video. <laughs> The pachyderm preamble, while I don't know it word for word, really stood out to me, and it made me say yes to just doing a community presentation in Wichita, Kansas. Because what the preamble ultimately says is that our government, our state, our city will function better when we have intentional minds and hearts looking at what's going on. That's ultimately what it's about, right? Are we pouring into a system? Are we creating the system? Are we a part of the solution and not just talking about the problem? And so for me, when I read your, read your preamble, I thought, this is worth my time. This is worth my time. And so I quickly just want to go over a few things. Briefly, what is human trafficking? What are some of the venues and forms? I then want to talk a little bit about some things going wrong in the anti-trafficking movement, some struggles that we're having and nationally but also within our own city and state. And then I want to offer up some solutions about what you all can do to address this issue of trafficking, but more broadly, abuse and exploitation. So with that human trafficking, what is it? Human trafficking includes both labor and sex trafficking. And it can occur at an international level or at a domestic level within our own city, within our own state, within our own country. Ultimately, what this breaks down to is abuse and exploitation. Abuse and exploitation. And when you think about the term exploitation and what that means, it's really about preying upon someone else's vulnerabilities. It's that simple. Specifically with human trafficking, we can break down the act into um, the, an action. So were they taken? Were they transported? Into a means through force, fraud, or coercion. So maybe it's false promises. Maybe it's threats of harm. And for the purpose of sex or labor. But, we, but, but, but the definition is quite simple, right? We don't have to overcomplicate this. 
Who can it happen to? Just about anybody. I'll never forget, last year I was speaking to some of our uh, college students on WSU campus and I asked them to raise their hands if they thought that human trafficking affected them or if they knew anybody that had been trafficked. And most of them said no, but what they didn't know is how many survivors of trafficking are right there on campus attending school. And many of those survivors are connected with us at the Center for Combating Human Trafficking. Are there risk factors of human trafficking? Absolutely. So things like socioeconomic status, whether or not you've experienced um, abuse in your own home, physically or sexually as a child, there's these risk factors. But ultimately, trafficking can happen to anyone. It knows no boundaries in terms of race, in terms of citizenship, in terms of sex or gender. It can happen to anyone. In terms of forms and venues, again, I mentioned that it can occur in both labor and for labor or sex, and those are the purposes, but it occurs in a multitude of businesses. We see this um, in the agriculture business. We see this in beauty salons and massage parlors, of course. We see this with um, the, the traveling sales companies that might sell magazines or carnivals. We, again, there's so many industries in which trafficking occurs. And we see this occurring on the streets. We see this occurring at truck stops. We see this occurring um, even within schools. I'll tell you one of the things that we even, and, and, and myself and my staff, we have over 100 and, 140 years cumulatively combined doing work with those who are vulnerable and mar marginalized, specifically young people who are runaway, who are homeless in foster care, who have been say, sex or labor trafficked. And, as much as we know, we too were surprised when we started doing presentations in our Wichita community, how many young people, because of those presentations, came forward and said, I'm experiencing abuse and exploitation, and specifically, I'm experiencing human trafficking. Some of those young people were trafficked by their own parents through pornography. So again, that's a form of human trafficking that we oftentimes forget about, that we don't think about. So again, we went over definition, forms, venues. Um, the consequences are enormous. Obviously, with this form of abuse and exploitation, whether it's for labor or sex, the person enduring that trafficking, it, trafficking experiences pain physically, biologically, psychologically, emotionally, socially, and spiritually. Dr. Vander Kolk says, the body keeps score. And I believe that quote is absolutely true. Oftentimes with those that we're serving and walking alongside, we see physical ailments, injuries that have gone unreported or unaddressed, but also the psychological damage. Um, many of them suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder or complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And they oftentimes have um, a really unique bond with their trafficker, with the person that's abusing them. And again, that creates a lot of difficulty for us when we are intervening in these situations. Trafficking has very much been misbranded within our country. I wanna hear from you all. When you think about human trafficking, what are some of the images that you have been shown through media, through the news, et cetera? Overseas. Overseas? Overseas. What does a victim typically look like in some of the posters or the branding that you've seen maybe through social media about trafficking? Young women. We typically see images of people bound, right? Or there's barcodes on them, or they look weak and they look broken, and we can go and rescue them, right? That's not how trafficking usually plays out. Oftentimes there is a unique trauma bond or for those of you who may be aware from the 70s, the term Stockholm Syndrome came about, right? Do you, do you all remember where that term came from? From a bank robbery in Stockholm, Sweden, where those who were captured in that bank robbery actually ended up for, forming a bond with the bank robber. And people actually saw them as part of the robbery and, and they were perpetrators as well. And that's oftentimes what happens in this human trafficking experience. And so this misbranding and then this um, sensationalizing of trafficking has been really negative for victims because oftentimes victims and survivors of trafficking are distrustful of our systems. I was speaking to um, 
a, a woman before this presentation started and she talked about different populations who may not come forward and report even rape or other forms of, of crime. And we have to then examine, well, what was their level of trust or, and even historically within a certain population, what was their level of trust with law enforcement or other systems of care? Now you add a trauma bond of that victim with their perpetrator, and it's highly unlikely that they're going to want to work within our systems with police, to, with uh, social service providers, with attorneys, and with judges, right? This, the scope of human trafficking is really difficult to capture. And this is largely because there is an under-reporting of it. Oftentimes folks don't even define human trafficking the same way. We don't have shared data systems. I'll tell you, um, I tend to update my numbers regularly. We do at the Center for Combating Human Trafficking. We keep track of all of our own data, but we also like to use data from other providers within our city, across the state, and across the country. And even within our own city, to get current runaway and homeless stats is completely difficult, it is entirely difficult. There's, it's really hard to capture data, whether it's for runaway and homeless youth or for trafficked individuals. So I could throw out the stats that 27 million people, it's been ed estimated that 27 million people are trafficked uh, throughout our country each year. But those are estimates. We do know that approximately 80% of them are women and 50% of those trafficked are children. Within our own state, we're very proud to be a part of the solution to um, better identifying and keeping track of numbers. We worked with the Attorney General's office, Attorney General Derek Schmidt, several years ago to create a tool to help us better define and identify those who are trafficked. In 2009, when Attorney General Schmidt reached out to all of his victim service providers across the state to find out how many trafficking victims they were serving, they, there were only two organizations that said, we are serving human trafficking victims, and each one had only served one. Now, we knew that wasn't reality. It's that they weren't defining human trafficking appropriately, and they didn't have a consistent way of defining that, and they weren't keeping track of the data. So we created a human trafficking definition and identification tool for the Attorney General's office, and he is now mandating that they, that be used through all victim service providers. We saw those numbers continue to increase since 2009, and in 2017, across all the victim service providers in the state, we identified 475 survivors of human trafficking. More importantly than just identifying them is that we were then able to apply um, effective services that were intentional to address that form of abuse and exploitation. That's the more critical piece. Why identify somebody? Why quote unquote rescue somebody if we're then not able to respond to their needs. I think that's really, really critical. I also want to point out that um, when we're identifying, we can also do harm. So some of you may have heard about Operation Cross Country, for example. Um, that is a, a group effort with law enforcement, with FBI, et cetera, and they travel across the state each October, or across the country each October, and they spend a few days um, doing sweeps where they identify victims. And oftentimes what happens in these Operation Cross Country sweeps is that more victims are arrested than those who are perpetrators. And when I say perpetrators, I mean those selling individuals who are being trafficked, and I also mean those who are purchasing trafficked persons. Unfortunately, what has happened within our own state, and this leads me into that next piece of, of what harmful things are going on within the movement, is that those victims identified are then sent to jail. This last year in Operation Cross Country, three minors were identified in the state of Kansas, and all three of those minors ended up in juvenile detention facilities. That's a concern. When you look at federal policy and federal law, specifically the Trafficking Victims Protection Act or other federal agencies um, on human trafficking, they highly recommend that we not detain victims of human trafficking. Because ultimately, a, a locked facility is not going to be responsive to the holistic needs, the biopsychosocial spiritual needs of an individual who has experienced significant trauma. We can't get them help there, right? And so some people would say, well, then we need other options. And absolutely, that's when we have to then say, how are we responsible 
We can't keep saying that, well, detainment is the best solution for those that we're claiming to be victims. It's quite amazing to me, and again, in connection to some of the harmful impacts of human trafficking, it's quite amazing to me how many dollars are being raised to combat human trafficking, right? We have races all over the country. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Five Ks, 10 Ks. We have fashion shows to combat human trafficking. There's a lot about human trafficking. There are homes, properties that are very, very expensive all over this country that are sitting empty with no victims and survivors in them, largely because people didn't know what they were really getting into when they said they wanted to work with human trafficking survivors. They're sitting empty. There's been a lot of money tossed around to combat trafficking. But the majority of those trafficked, specifically those who are minors, remain in jails in our country. 76% of all minor females detained in this country are detained in connection to an offense that was deemed prostitution or human trafficking, a sex-related crime. That's a concern. There's been numerous cases that have gained national attention in terms of uh, the de detainment of victims of human trafficking. Sarah Cruzan, Centoya Brown, many cases. And many folks across Kansas have even talked about these cases. But it's important for us to remember that we have some of our own cases of that. I'm thinking about several young ladies that I have the opportunity to know that experienced abuse and exploitation in their homes very early on. Many of them were first sold into trafficking by a parent or a caregiver. And at some point, they were then introduced to the street life experience of trafficking, where they then had a pimp. And they were sold, and they became a part of that life. Many of them, under the force, fraud, and coercion of a trafficker, then began to also participate in the recruitment and of the obtaining of other minors within that same unit of trafficking. And because our systems don't quite know what to do with this population, we then charge them with crimes. And we didn't offer them true solutions. And so what can we do about this? I think we're charged to do something, right? Especially when I think about the pachyderm preamble and what we're here to do. We can't just say this is somebody else's problem. We can't turn our, our eyes away from this issue. I think the Center for Combating Human Trafficking is offering um, one of the unique models, which is why we're recognized across the country, which is why we're in Washington, D.C. quite often working with the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department um, of Family Youth and Service Bureau and the Office for Victims of Crime and the Office of Juvenile Justice Detention Prevention and training providers all over the country on the, our model. We do operate, the Center for Combating Human Trafficking operates as a not-for-profit under the university structure. We are connected to liberal arts and, and sciences college, but ultimately we function within the university as a whole because we want to offer opportunities for victims and survivors of human trafficking to really become who they were created to be. So our model is really this. We train folks on how to be mentors and how to be friends and family and partners with those who have experienced labor and sex trafficking by training them on our Lotus anti-trafficking model. Some people would say, well, what is a model and, and why does that matter? A model gives us really a framework for asking, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Is it working, right? Again, when I look at a lot of anti-trafficking efforts and I'll ask folks, are you even keeping track of your outcomes? Is this effective? How much money are you spending on this program, but can you see any progress with those that you're serving? This is what it allows us to do. So we train folks on our model and then we work with survivors in our psychoeducational groups. We offer a community to them in which they connect with other survivors of human trafficking. And then we pay for their education. We also offer them an internship in which they're being paid to work with somebody else um, in their field that they want to go into when they graduate. By the way, we have a couple survivors right now that are working towards their master's degree on Wichita State campus. So we're very proud of that model. 
that offers folks an opportunity to be self-sustainable, that they're not just dependent upon a system. And I really encourage you as you think about all of the problems going on in the state of Kansas, whether that's how many kids are runaways or the class action suit against DCF, I really encourage you to think about how can I be a part of the solution? Can I step up? Can I be a mentor? Can I support services that offer mentors? Can I help pay for a young person's education? We have to stop expecting that one individual in a civic leadership position or one system is going to fix all of our community problems. That's not ever how we were set up to, to operate, right? So when I think about specifically what you all can do, I ask you to think about how you might give of your time, of your talent, and of your treasure. When I think about time, for me that really starts with just really thinking about how might you learn more? How might you educate yourself more? We have a resource book that um, we offer with, at the Center for Combating Human Trafficking that has a multitude of peer-reviewed journal articles. This isn't just our random blogs and thoughts. These are peer-reviewed journal articles on what is trafficking, how do we address trafficking, Read literature. If you care about doing something on, about human trafficking, read literature. Look to evidence-based practices. Do something that really makes a difference. Again, even within our own state, I think about how many folks with really great hearts have started their own programs. And yet most not-for-profit startups die within the first few years. They raise a lot of money, and then they sizzle out. Because they didn't take the time to really study on what they were doing and why they were doing it and how to measure its efficacy. So study up. In terms of your time, I also ask you to really ensure that you prevent trafficking starting in your own home, in your own community, within your churches, within your local schools. I try to hold myself accountable because I'm out there combating human trafficking every day and I've been doing this work for 23 years, but I have my own two kids. So combating human trafficking really starts with, am I a volunteer in my kid's school? Am I a person that's not just Dr. Roseworm at the front of the room, but a person who's wearing old jeans and ugly tennis shoes and I'm sitting on the floor of a cl classroom with first graders? That's preventing human trafficking. It seems simple. When I, when I tell people about tra trafficking, they always want to meet a human trafficking survivor. That seems very voyeuristic to me, right? There's a lot of ways to prevent trafficking that are very meaningful, and it starts with you. It starts close in with you. Preventing trafficking, I also think about Attorney General Derek Schmidt's um, demand and end campaign right now. And many people have critiqued that campaign because they say, what are you really doing? And I, think, I struggle because, um, yes, we do need to do things in terms of increasing opportunities and accessible opportunities for, for those experiencing the multitude of isms. And we need to offer more housing and we need to intervene, right? But we also have to prevent trafficking and that starts also with men saying, I'm not going to purchase sex or I'm not going to depend on cheap or free labor. So it starts with us. In terms of talent, I cannot talk about talent in this city without mentioning one of my dear friends, Doug Coe, is an attorney. And he has offered his talent of being an attorney to help defend or um, offer other services for children, youth, and families who have experienced abuse and exploitation. He's offered that talent as a gift in this field. At one, at one point in his life, he thought he wanted to full-time work in trafficking, in the trafficking movement. But that's not what hand was dealt to him, right? He's a, he does boring attorney stuff um, on accounts and properties and different things like that, but he gets to volunteer in trafficking cases. I also think some of the other talent of many people, whether they're accountants that come and speak to our Pathway to Prosperity program to survivors to teach them about how to handle their, their um, bank accounts, how to spend their money, how to have a budget. I think about folks who share their talent of sewing to come and teach survivors how to sew on a button so that they don't just throw away the shirt when something breaks on it. 
And then of course, treasure. One of the things you can do today, and Kaylin has um, some sponsorship forms, we have a multitude of events, uh, multiple events in January. January is deemed National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And we always look for, sur sur for sponsors for our Human Trafficking Conference, which is the last Friday of January. So if you're interested in being a sponsor or your business is, is interested in being a sponsor of our conference, we would appreciate that. But then also, as I mentioned, our Pathway to Prosperity program and our Prevention for Prosperity program serves young people and survivors of human trafficking, both labor and sex, in our community. Nearly each year, we, we offer Prevention for Prosperity curriculum to elementary age, middle school age, and high school age young people in our community. Last year, we offer that prevention education to just over 1,500 young people, and we offer that within our community at no cost. So again, as a not-for-profit, we're bringing in our money from grants and from individual donors, and also from contracts from serving providers around the country. And then we offer all of these services to young people and to survivors within Wichita at no cost. So we served over, um, we, we trained over 16,000 individuals in our country already thus far in 2018. Last year we provided prevention to nearly, a little over 1,500 young people. And this year in 2018, we've already served 29 survivors, 29 survivors of human trafficking that are receiving our services at the Center for Combating Human Trafficking at Wichita State. And so specifically, in addition to sponsoring a conference, giving a donation to help provide prevention education or to sponsor a survivor is extremely helpful to our services. We have a current match grant gift going, so any donations given to those programs will be doubled up to $100,000 through July 2019. So that's a potential $200,000 that we can put back into our community. Wonderful. That we can put back into our community, $200,000. So um, if those programs, um, you're interested in those, we'd really appreciate that. And your impact will be doubled because of the match gift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, good job, Kaylin. That's, that's not my expertise. That's Kaylin's expertise, asking for money and sponsorships. So with that, again, just to summarize this, we talked a little bit about what is human trafficking. It's ultimately abuse and exploitation that preys upon the vulnerabilities of other people. We talked a little bit briefly about the scope, the venues, the forms. We talked about some of the struggles, right? We cannot arrest our way out of this problem. We cannot race our way out of this problem. We're going to have to get involved. We're going to have to get our hands dirty. Um, not to put him on the spot, but Judge Smith, um, wrote a, a column, a piece, a, an opinion piece in the paper, I believe, last week um, about the state of, our, our, of Kansas and the Department of Children and Families and really calling people to say, let's quit just complaining about it and let's do something about it. And I agree with that. And that's going to require all of us to keep our eyes and our ears open and to at times challenge the status quo and to at times even some of our leaders who have been put in positions where they're really great wonderful people but to say we have to have some hard conversations because just allowing our kids to fall off the face of the earth is not acceptable to just lock kids up is not acceptable these are the least among us and it's our responsibility to ensure that, that we respond to their vulnerabilities. I feel that I'm raising my family here in Wichita. I have a 15-year-old son and I have a six-year-old daughter. I, I should say we, they're not just my children. My husband and I have a 15-year-old son who is a lovely young man and a six-year-old very feisty little lady. Um, and I think about my children have a lot of benefits because they have a mom and a dad and a community that loves them and they're connected and they have resources but I genuinely feel that I could just focus on them but their potential for success is really I have to look at what about the least among them right they're only as good they will only have as good of opportunities as those that also are in their schools and in their communities that are struggling so I really challenge you to think about that. And I challenge you to think about, again, how do you not just sit in a presentation or watch the news and complain or say there's a problem, but how do you really invest in your time, in your talent, 
and in your treasure to make Wichita, to make our great state of Kansas a better place to live. Thank you. I'm a little bit chagrined because the Pachyderm preamble says it is our belief that most of the corrupting influences in American politics could be erased and government made more responsive by one basic improvement, that is simply for more good citizens to participate in politics. Quote, we get the government we deserve, not the one we wish for, unquote, remains a guide store, guide star for free people. Uh, I Did I think, kind of capture it? Yes. It, uh, <laughs> and, let me just walk, walk through the ground rules here very quickly and open with the initial question. We're going to, Pachyderm members are going to, be, going to be first. I'm going to hand off the microphone here and just place your hand up, particularly for Pachyderm Club members to ask the first questions. I'm going to take the prerogative today. Uh, in my presentation that I mentioned before about the EMCU, I didn't mention the Child Advocacy Center, which was a major step. Uh, by local government and the private sector here, including bringing in not only the state uh, social s support services and social workers there, but also uh, medical and an all-in-one facility. And sometimes we've had people who are put into juvenile detention strictly because they literally had nothing and there was no other place. We didn't know anywhere else to put them. With the, ad, with the advent of the Child Advocacy Center model and the EMCU that we have here, how does South Central Kansas compare to the rest of the country in terms of what we're trying to do compared to the other, you know, well, you've got over 3,000 counties in the rest of the country and, and uh, probably more like 10,000 municipalities all over the United States. I'll hand this off to Joe. Put interest in your answer. Well, first of all, I want my water, and I don't know where it's at. <laughs> oh, um, thanks. Okay, so a couple things. Again, because I didn't because I didn't have my slides. Um, when I had the preamble, the pachyderm preamble, I also shared a quote on there, um, and so thank you for reminding me of it. You know, many people, when I talk about trafficking, they say, this is, isn't this modern day slavery? This is something new, or isn't it worse now? No, right? Trafficking has been around since the beginning of time. But specifically, I think about a text written in 1893 by Charlton Edholm, um, who was doing her work initially much more from a missions or faith-based standpoint. But I really appreciate what she said in this text written in 1893, talking about and even utilizing the term trafficking she was talking about how various populations, specifically populations at risk, were trafficked. And then she ends up saying, and so people claim, you know, how can this happen in the United States, in the land of Bibles and, you know, great spirits and wonderful things going on? And she says, ultimately, because we, by our ballots and by our inaction, allow it to. And so, again, we get, we, we don't just get what we wish for, we get what we work for, right? And so we have to work for what we want. To address um, your question, so I, as I mentioned, I do spend a lot of my time traveling across the country and I'm always trying to bring back what are best practices, what is evidence practice uh, to my own city, to my own state. And so I think one of the things that even nationally folks are struggling with, with the Child Advocacy Center model, so I'm not speaking specifically about our model, I would like to uh, maybe back away from the personalization of it and just speak from the model as a whole, which is a national model that we borrowed, um, that it was really based out of Florida, is that there's, while there's benefits to bringing everybody under one roof, there's also a lot of struggles. So much of that model was structured for kind of a typical child abuse victim because the thought was that if they only have to tell their story once or share their experience of abuse to one person or one entity and then everyone under that same roof can then work together, that's less traumatizing for that young person. But as you can imagine, even with just the brief definitions I provided on human trafficking, these types of victims represent quite differently. They're oftentimes more difficult and more combative within an investigation process. And so what we're seeing, um, and this is again true all over the country with providers, is that that CAC model can at times be harmful because of groupthink, 
So why, so there's collaboration and then there's groupthink. Those are two different things, right? Collaboration doesn't mean that we all need to do the same thing and act in the same role. So groupthink happens when there's role drift. So as a social worker, for example, I don't necessarily want to work that case and go along with maybe what the off the police officer has found it in that investigation. Perhaps my role is more to be an advocate for that victim or that survivor. Perhaps my role might even be to challenge some of the typical structural procedures. And so what we're seeing is within human trafficking units and programming is that we really try to ensure that while we use, might use some of the services within a CAC model nationally, we need to ensure that providers keep their separateness in terms of how they're um, reviewing the case and how they're responding to the case. And, and how the, specifically how they are um, protecting the rights and the autonomy of that individual survivor. Does that answer your question? Well, are we ahead or behind the rest of the country? I don't know that I would like to say that. I think that, it, again, it's just like within Department of Children and Families. So I want to say we can get better, but to just simply critique and say we're behind or better. I don't want to get into that. What I would like to say is that I think we need to ensure and we need to push for procedures that ensure that there's not groupthink to ensure that specifically vulnerable populations are protected. Because if a law enforcement comes, law enforcement officer comes in and interviews a certain victim or survivor and they form a negative relationship and then next thing you know, the case has gone way out of control, which is oftentimes what has led to some of the prosecutions within our own city and state. All right, thank you very much for being here. Um, so the irony of this conversation after the conversation I just had with my 17-year-old daughter yesterday is quite, quite stark. She has been very, very passionate about human trafficking for many years and, and plans on um, studying that in some way, shape, or form. And uh, when I told her you were here speaking, her, you should have seen the mind blown emoji that got sent to me because now she has a direction. So first of all, I need to get your information before we leave. Second of all, she wants to ask what she can do to be on the lookout for that type of thing right now, being a young woman as well, having many friends around the state, and, and what she can do to help protect people as well. That's a great question. So I'm going to um, push for our prevention programming. So many of you may be aware that, for example, some of the drug programs, DARE education programs, actually in research show that the increased risk of certain populations for then using drugs after they receive the education. That is true for prevention. So you really want to make sure that you're accessing prevention that is being facilitated by qualified professionals and that the prevention education is based in um, a public health model and in in evidence and in research and so that's what our model is and our prevention curriculum is fabulous and one of the fabulous pieces about it is that the last module engages young people to be leaders within their own schools and communities to then help prevent and, and intervene in situations of trafficking so first of all on the most basic of level without giving you another hour talk on this is that one of the number one prevention factors for young people in trafficking is that they learn to be critical thinkers and critical consumers, right? So teaching critical thought, teaching how to look at something and say, it, what is this really trying to sell me? Or what is their purpose? What is the true argument behind this? Um, and then also with that really teaching girls and young women specifically um, in regards to sex trafficking, which is oftentimes what people are thinking about, how to really value themselves as a whole and that our value is not found in somebody thinking that we're pretty or, or wanted sexually. And that's, the, for me, those are the two easy starts, right? Um, but I would encourage you to reach out to us with our prevention curriculum. I will tell you, we've provided a series of um, the prevention in a, a local school this year who just really took the reins more than any other school in the past. And they are leading efforts across the state with other uh, schools to then go out and educate. And so we teach in a way that allows young people to then go out and teach themselves. Okay, we've got a question over here, then I'll be over to you. Um, you mentioned the, the public media images that we have as, as being stereotypical of what we think of. I don't know what percentage you think that might be, but what as this crowd or white middle class America, what are some examples that we need to be more aware of that might, we might even be shocked as the definition of trafficking and that we need to be up watch for or more involved in? Yeah. So 
a couple things. I mean, first of all, I could give you these indicators, like, right, you're seeing somebody and they don't look at you in the face, or maybe they have, they do have some branding or tattoo, or you're walking in Target and you see that somebody won't let go of, of that young person and that young person looks like maybe they're afraid. I could tell you all these indicators, but I think that we oftentimes can um, unintentionally encourage people thinking that everywhere they, they're like fear, unrational fear, right? And I don't wanna do that. Um, I think you know, if you see something that you feel uncomfortable about, just doesn't seem right, say something, do something about it, right? Go tell somebody. Um, but also I think it takes us just getting comfortable in our own skin to say, is everything okay here? Right? And we oftentimes are too afraid to do that. I will also tell you, you, you mentioned um, what are some things that we might need to be aware of in terms of how trafficking looks. So oftentimes traffickers, I think about one of the young ladies that's in our program, for example, she's actually been attending Wichita, Wichita State now for the last two years, and she was sold by her parents um, and, and trafficked across even international borders. Um, and her parents still try to maintain control over her from a different country and have even called the providers to try to get money out of them. Um, but that also happens here domestically in our own city, like I said. So, you know, we think about, when we think about the image of a trafficker, we kind of have just this one image of a person in a purple feather cap, and you know, that's not really reality, right? We have young kids who are traffickers, we have parents who are traffickers, um, we have husbands that are traffickers, or brothers, or sisters, et cetera, so the, it looks a variety of ways. Uh, thank you for being here, and, and this is an interesting topic and one close to my heart. I run the Kansas Coalition for Life, and uh, we offer help to women who are abortion-bound at the gates of the uh, South Bend Abortion Clinic. Uh, since 2004, we've had 523 women that have opted to accept our help, and uh, we've, we've helped them uh, uh, you know, until their baby turns uh, 18 years old, which means that uh, Nobody has turned 18 yet. We've only started in 2004. So one of these, I'm going to say about a dozen of them, I would think probably fit your definition of trafficking, but I'm not real clear what your definition is. Well, so again, as I mentioned, when you're looking at the definition of, tra of trafficking, is there an action? So obtained, transported, held, right? All the, there's multiple actions. Is there a means through force? fraud or coercion, which by the way, if they're under the age of 18, by federal law, you do not have to prove if, if there was forced fraud or coercion. So for example, within our own state, folks oftentimes argue and say, no, see, they kind of wanted to be with this trafficker, so they're, they're a perpetrator, not a victim. If they're under 18, you don't have to prove it. For the, meet, for the actions means purpose is labor or sex. So again, I don't know this individual and with your brief story to, to tell you whether or not it for sure is, but you know, if she is being obtained and provided housing by this person, but he's forcing her to stay home and watch these kids, and she got, I mean, perhaps, um, but again, for me to not know her or, or look at the case and interview that individual, for me to make a determination of that is not appropriate. Well, we're pressing on uh, just about being out of time, but before we do, uh, you had an intriguing statement about fundraising. Mm -hmm. Would you like to take 60 seconds to talk a little bit more about it before we close? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Kaylin can and then I'll wrap up. Okay, since I didn't really have the mic before earlier, what, I, what we rely on at the center, we are a nonprofit even though we are under the structure of the universities, so we rely on donor dollars to do our prevention and survivor programming, which Dr. Rosenbaum did briefly talk about. Um, and so these, these are uh, given to our community at no cost. And, and our survivors in our program do know that, so they do know that they're receiving these um, services at no cost because donors who will never make them care enough about them to fund these programs. And so we do have a $100,000 match gift going on right now by an anonymous donor. So any dollars given will go directly to those programs. Just to give you some numbers, $250 supplies seven survivors with our participant guide and our pathway to prosperity program. So this is a guide. We make them really nice. We want to give something to them that we're proud of and that they can keep and they can refer back to and it has all of our curriculum in it. $1,000 gives a um, scholarship to a survivor for books for one semester. $2,000 provides them part-time tuition to WSU for one survivor. As far as prevention, $500 enables us to go to a small school, but about 50 youth. Uh, $1,500 allows us to go to 200 to 300 youth in our community or a larger school. So that's just an example of what dollars can do in our program. Um, and again, through July 2019, all of that will be doubled.
Thank you. And I want to challenge you as I wrap up. I want to challenge each of you. The next time I come to Pachyderm Club and my presentation actually works in your old projector, maybe first of all you need to get a new projector. Um, but my projector works. The next time I come back to Pachyderm Club and I say, "What's your preamble?" You better know it. You better know it, right? I want I want at least five of you to be able to stand up and say it. With that, again, I challenge you to not just hear. I cannot reiterate this enough. When I think about, oh my gosh, I'm doing another talk in Wichita, Kansas, what's gonna happen? A person who started their own organization or complained about how broken the system is, right? This is not healthy. I challenge you to not just to let this go in one ear and out the other. I challenge you to really think about how can you give, if you care about trafficking, how can you connect with organizations that have been around, that are survivor informed, that are survivor led, people who have lived experience, right? Working within these systems and that have been in the field and that there's evidence in what they do. How can you build on and leverage what they're doing? How can you give of your time? How can you give of your talent and of your treasure? And we would love your support with the conference. We would love your support with Pathway to Prosperity and the Prevention for Prosperity programming. Thank you.